Today we're talking about the three best revenue streams to generate income and we're focusing primarily on passive income, um, passive revenue streams. Okay, so why do we wanna do this? We wanna increase our cash flow. I know a lot of you reach out to me all the time, like cash flow is the issue, and you're not sure why. Like you are making sales, you do have the revenue. It's like there's gotta be holes somewhere, there's gotta be gaps. Cash flow is a big thing that um, additional revenue streams will help with. And then the second reason is, is, as entrepreneurs, but anyone, we always want to not put all our eggs in one basket. So we don't wanna put all of our income generating eggs into one basket. Um, we want to make sure that we have multiple streams of income for our businesses. That way we're reducing the risk, right? So like, let's say one stream or our main stream doesn't do so well one month for whatever reasons, right? Let's say you typically earn 10,000 from that stream. And then all of a sudden this month it's down to five or less, right? If you have additional revenue streams, that's reducing the risk to the, um, or it's reducing, reducing the impact of that one stream having on your business as a whole, okay? So it's actually best practice to have multiple income streams so that you have those various um, cash flow sources streaming in. And ideally you wanna have about seven, at least seven streams of income. And I know that seems like a lot, so don't panic if you're like seven streams of income, that's a lot. Might sound like a lot, but there are a lot of things that you might be already doing that actually are another stream of income that you just like don't realize are. Okay. Um, I don't know if any of you know Jenna Kucher. I like I love watching her. She's this like influencer on Instagram. I think she actually became famous because, or like she kind of went viral because she posted a picture of herself with her husband. And he's like super duper fit, and she's like got you know more of a fuller body. And there was all this backlash, it like crazy backlash, like. People are saying crazy things like, why would be he with her? Like all the superficial stuff. But anyways, it like kind of blew up and it went viral. And now she's this really big influencer and she's like a founder of a podcast I listen to, blah, blah, blah. So she said on a podcast once, and this stuck with me, she said, I, she had read somewhere that most millionaires have about seven streams of income. So she said in that moment, she decided, and she did it, to spend a year building eight. So she was like, all right, if all these big millionaires have seven streams of income, I'm going to build eight. All right. Like, wow. And she did it. Okay. So, um, one general rule of thumb before we get into, so we said the why before we get into, um, the myths that we want to be careful of. And then the, my three favorites or, or top revenue streams that are passive income. I do want to say you want to make sure that at least one income source is fully within your control. Some of the ones we're gonna discuss um, today might have other factors that play a role or they might somewhat be dependent on another company or another platform, things like that. So you wanna make sure at least one of your revenue streams is completely within your control, okay? And again, that's just to reduce the risk factor um, so that you are not putting all your eggs in somebody else's basket, um, but also so that you have control over the success of your business. All right, so I had posted earlier this week maybe Monday, I forget, a really good article that talked about the myths of passive income. And I think this is important because when we hear passive income, people get like ecstatic. They're like, wait, you mean I don't have to do anything and I'm gonna be getting paid? And it's like, does if that sounds too good to be true, it's too good to be true, right? Or else everybody would be having a million passive income streams and they would just be like sitting at the beach all day. So there are a lot of myths regarding passive income and I, I did post that um, article for you to read more fully through, but I wanna just kind of talk about the most important ones. Um, one of them is that whole idea that like, you just set it and forget it with passive income. And, and as much as that sounds lovely, like all things you need to have oversight. This is like one of the most dangerous thoughts or myths about passive income. And I think that's why a lot of people, it almost sets people up for failure because the minute they have to do any work, they're like, wait, I thought this was supposed to be passive income. So that's not really, the definition of passive income is not, you just set it and forget it. Or like, it's completely this machine that doesn't need your oversight at all. Okay, so that's one of the myths that I think is important to point out. Um, and they had a quote in that article I really liked. They said, if, you're, if you aren't doing your part to stay on top of the industry changes, your customer expectations and other responsibilities, um, that you'd find in like more of an active business, then your passive income is gonna dry up quickly because other people are gonna be doing that, right? So that's one myth I wanted to like point out. Passive income is not some like amazing, like just gift that lands in your lap and you never have to touch it again. It does require some work and most of the work 
is um, front loaded, but it does also require maintenance and work throughout. Okay. Another myth is that you can just like get a, a passive income revenue stream started in like one day or one weekend. I'm just going to start a blog and I'm just going to do it all in one weekend. And then I'm going to get all this money and all these people are going to come and read it. And it's going to be wonderful. I don't want to dash dreams that can happen, but it's not going to be one weekend. It does require work and it is going to require, um, consistency. Okay. And then another, another myth that they pointed out that I think is really important is, um, that real estate is the safest form of passive income. That's something that's said a lot. And now I am not against real estate as a, a form of, of um, additional revenue. However, I think calling it passive income is quite misleading because, you know, we see those, we see like all the shows on TV where they're like flipping homes or they're just buying these homes and renting them out. And it seems very hands off and it seems stress free and like this win, 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 win situation. However, the reality is there is a lot of oversight needed if you're going to either do management of a property or if you're going to flip it. Okay, so it's not truly passive in that sense. Even though it's called passive income, um, you just wanna make sure you're not interpreting that as like, oh, I'm not gonna need to do anything because there's gonna be repairs that need to be done, updates, dealing with tenants, all this other stuff. And even if you're paying a management company to do it, because that does take a lot of the, the responsibilities and tasks off your plate, um, you still have to have oversight over that management company. Sometimes you're not happy with that management company and you need to change it. Um, very early on, I would say when I was it, when I was 25, um, I had my first income property. It was a condo in Brighton and, um, I didn't use a management company. I did it on my own and I will tell you it was quite stressful. Okay. Um, now I went into it thinking this is going to be so easy, right? Like this is so great. Um, and it, was great and technically it wasn't hard, but there was more involved than I realized. For instance, in the middle of the winter when the um, heating unit just died and I had to buy a brand new one and nobody was around to be scheduled. So I was at Home Depot in the middle of the night getting space heaters and bringing them to the to the apartment and to the condo or you know, um, their dog did some damage and having to deal with that and all this. So there's more involved. It's not 100% passive. And that's a big myth about um, having real estate as a passive source of income. Again, I'm not against it. I think it's wonderful, but I think it just needs a little bit more clarity there about the fact that it's not 100% passive. So you're probably wondering, so what is passive income then? If I'm saying it's not all these things. So an income stream is considered passive if it just requires very little maintenance, little to no maintenance, but very rarely is there no maintenance, um, and the money keeps flowing. So if something requires very little maintenance or um, just like upkeep type of maintenance, not like creating new things or um, you know putting in a lot of time, then it's considered passive income, okay? So we've talked about why we wanna do it, right? To help with our cash flow. We don't wanna put all our eggs in one basket because you know all of a sudden economy, um, political factors, personal factors could happen that you know we have to pull back from one stream so we want the other ones to take over. Um, so we've talked about the why, we've talked about some of the myths or the misunderstandings about passive income. Um, and now I want to tell you my three favorites. There are so many different kinds, okay? But my three favorites uh, to not only have it be um, passive income in the sense that free up your time, but the ones that um, perhaps have the least risk involved or minimize the risk from your pers your small business as a whole by, by adding on these streams of income. Um, there are three I'm going to talk about, and then I'll talk about one that's a little bit more advanced. So the first one is to promote affiliates. Okay. You may have heard of affiliate marketing. Um, it can be promoting a product, a company that sells a product or a service. Um, it's one of the most powerful ways to generate like multiple passive income streams, but it's not easy necessarily. Okay. All of these passive income streams do require work, especially on the front end. Okay. Um, it's a really good one if you already have like a huge massive following because you're going to need a large following in order for this to be successful, right? People need to know you and follow you to care about what you're recommending, right? Um, so you need a big platform uh, and you need a big audience. So that those are kind of the um, top ones. If you don't have a big platform or a big audience, you can still do it, but you're going to be spending money in advertising. And then you have to ask yourself like, you know, um, what is, is this really fleshing out to be uh, beneficial or am I putting into work? Is it too much work? Is it passive or not? Um, so you 
want to make sure that when you're thinking of affiliate marketing, you're thinking more long term because it is the type of thing that um, will really be a long term investment for you, especially if you're putting in any money with ads. Um, but it also really you want to make sure that you're being genuine in what you recommend. And I can't stress that enough because I'm sure we've all done it, but I have like someone I follow and I'm not going to say the name because I don't want to like, you know, I think she's lovely, but she recommends all of these different platforms. And there was, a, when I first started off my business, I was like, yeah, I need that. I need that. I need, she says it's the best, right? And I quickly realized that they weren't the best platforms. And again, everything's opinion. So maybe in her opinion it was, but what I found was look, most of the affiliates that she was working with, um, had the highest affiliate payback um, model. So they gave the most money for like, you know, if you sold their program. Um, so I quickly realized that she tends to gravitate towards affiliate programs that had a wonderful affiliate, you know, rewards package for the people that were doing it. And it's, it's not bad. It's not, but I just think it's a good rule of thumb and it's just kind of good karma for you to make sure that what you are recommending is also, based on what the reward will be for you, that has to be there because, again, this is your business, but also that you're being genuine and you are not just suggesting something that has a good payout for you, but will actually benefit um, your audience. Okay, so I think that's really important. Um, and then the other beauty, beauty thing, beautiful thing about um, affiliate marketing is you can start to outsource these tasks. So if you have freelancers or contractors or interns or whatever, um, it's, it's kind of like mindless work to do posts about it and, you know, create your content for that. So a lot of it can be outsourced, which adds to the feeling of passive income. Um, the second of my faves for um, additional revenue streams that tend to be passive would be selling uh, intangible or tangible products. So tangible meaning, you know, like a product, like uh, you're selling, um, you know, a planner, like a, a spiral bound actual planner. Intangible would be something like a digital product, like you've taken it and you have a digital version and you're selling that. Ideally for passive income, digital products are the way to go, right? Because then you don't have to create more, you don't have to worry about shipping, you don't have to worry about returns, all the those other things. You, they can purchase it, download it, done, right? So it takes so that makes it much more passive. So if you have an ebook or printables or um, anything that you can repurpose that you already have and you can put on like an e-commerce e site. Uh, so you really want to, for this one, you want to take stock, stock of what you already have. I know that there are so many of my clients that have created so many materials, either, you know, when they were first starting out and then they kind of changed lanes or they've created things and forgot they created them. Or um, maybe they just need to like, you know, freshen it up a tiny bit and then they can monetize that. So it's really important to take stock of what you already have, because again, these are the whole point of this is try to make it as passive or as inactive as possible and ask, how can I repurpose this, this content? If you did a, um, if you have a bunch of, for instance, like tutorial videos that you did once, maybe you did it for a client. Maybe you um, have a friend that you've done, like show them how to do things that other people could benefit from and you just have them lying around. You can bundle those and sell those as like a mini course or a little like how to bundle. Um, so if you don't have anything laying around, no problem, you can make it. And once you create it, you can sell it for life. So that is the beauty. And that's what makes this considered passive, especially with digital products, because you make it once and then you can sell it for life. And that's when people say like, you're earning money in your sleep, right? That's what that means. People are purchasing it. I don't know, another time zone in the middle of the night, maybe, or maybe they just can't, they're like somebody who can't sleep well like me and they're in the middle of the night, like buying things. Um, so that's, that's wonderful. And if you don't have, like sometimes I have clients that don't have a, their own website or a platform because for their specific business, they don't need it. That's fine. You can sell things like you could sell digital items on Etsy, right? Um, I'm sure you've all bought something on Etsy. Have you ever thought about selling on there, right? Selling on Etsy and those are good again because there's no maintenance. Once it's up and running, I mean, you want to make sure that you are responding to customers and, you know, having good customer service and all of that. But once you've created the project, the product, it's there and it's going to stay there and people can download it. You can perfect it. Um, let's say this is one that, um, I had one of my clients do because she's not a photographer. One of, I do have photographer clients, but in this particular, um, one is not a photographer. She's an interior designer but she takes awesome pictures. And I was like, how do you do that? Just with her iPhone. And they're like amazing. So she now, we set it all up. She's selling professional photos online, stock photos. Okay, so there's like Pexels. I think it's P-E-X-E-L-S. 
uh, check my spelling on that, iStock, Shutterstock, all these places that you may have purchased an image before from for like your content. But all those people creating that, they're making that money. And again, they take that picture, they upload it, and they just keep making money from it. You know, on Canva, there's the ones that they you can make money from, right? So that's my number two favorite um, revenue stream. Kiana, you agree? Oh, good. There's a little delay in my comments, so I'm not sure exactly what you're agreeing with, but yay. <laughs> um, all right, the third thing that I highly recommend, um, don't mind my hair. I went swimming right before this, and it looks atrocious. Um, sidetracked, a little ADHD here. The third thing I recommend if you are looking for additional revenue streams, and again, you should be unless you have seven, at least seven already. So probably most of you, you know, it's always good to have another one. Oh, awesome. Yeah, everything. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, the third one would be to adopt a subscription based model. Um, this is kind of like the wave of the future. I mean, it already has been for like this past year, but it's okay. Like, you, you didn't miss the wave, right? Um, a subscription based model. So instead of like a one time payment for a one time client, the, the way this is works is usually it's monthly subscriptions. It doesn't have to be monthly, but usually it is. Um, and businesses collect a monthly fee. So you would collect a monthly fee. And um, what it does is usually if you have a, a program, the good thing about it is you can give discounts to the people that have that monthly fee. You're not always just giving free stuff. Sometimes for that monthly fee, it's fee, it's discounts on things. It's um, getting things early, like the early bird specials, things like that. Um, and this model is great because what it does is it like spikes your cash flow in the beginning and then it helps to kind of stabilize your income. So when somebody signs up for a subscription, right, and you have all these maybe other products or services in the background that you're doing and that subscription and all those subscriptions building is stabilizing your base income. So when we talked about not putting all of your money, your income generating uh, money in one basket or ideas in one basket, like not just having one stream. This is a really great one because it's more consistent. Okay. Of course, you're going to have people maybe cancel a subscription or you might have more people sign up one month than another. That happens. But what research shows is usually when people get a subscription, they stay in it for a long time. So this is just kind of like um, helping to, again, decrease the risk in your total revenue and give you a nice cushion there. And there's a couple different ways that you can have subscription based models. You could just have like a newsletter. So if you're thinking like, oh, this seems like a lot of work, and blah, you could just have a newsletter, subscription based newsletter it goes out an email once a month. Um, it has to create value. I mean, people aren't going to want to buy it unless it's value. Right. So it has to be very, you know, be packed with value. Um, and then you're thinking, well, wait, is that still passive income? Because I'm creating this newsletter. So yes, you are creating content, but you would create that content for one person and now you are getting the, the income from all of those members. So it's still considered passive income in the sense of low maintenance per client. So remember we talked about what passive income really means versus what sometimes it's sold as when we hear about it. Okay, so you're still creating that content, but it's pretty passive in the sense you're making it for one and then it's delivered to all these others. Another way to do subscription based model is with a membership. So this can be a membership in the mail. People get things in the mail, but again, that requires more, right? Just like digital products versus like a tangible product. Once you're getting into shipping and returns and creating the more of the products themselves, it gets trickier. It's more maintenance. It's less passive. It's more active. Okay. So if you can do something that's more passive in the sense of a membership site, right? Or um, if you're in a service industry and you just, you take that and you're just creating on your website, a membership based option or a portal, if that's, that's an option, there's one. Um, and again, often you are giving customers like a discount compared to like, if they got a one-off purchase or some things for free, but some of them are just discounted. Okay. Because you want to make sure that you're not like, Oh, what's that expression? I can't think of the expression. I don't even think it makes sense. Like selling the cow. That doesn't even make sense. That's about like dating. <laughs> but anyways, I digress. But you want to make sure that you're not giving everything for free just for this monthly subscription and that you're not like, you know, giving away all these things that are way more valuable. Okay. Um, so, so be careful with that. Just because someone's a subscriber doesn't mean like they get everything for free. Okay. Um, but if you don't have like a platform, you don't have a website, you can always use a platform like Facebook, Facebook groups. I'm sure you've seen it before. You can either have a strictly paid Facebook group, 
right? Um, you can't do the payment collection through Facebook. That's like not allowed. But what you can do is you can do it separately. It's super easy to set up. You could hop on a call with me. I could walk you through it. It takes no time at all to set that part up. And then once people pay and they become members, then you just send them the link to the Facebook group and you accept them in. So it's still a membership. It's just not the payments, not through Facebook. Okay. Cause they, you know, understandably don't want to get involved in all that. The other option you may have seen if you're in a Facebook group, that's more like freemium style, like anyone can be in it. But if you want to be VIP, then you pay for a membership. And that's a little different. Usually again, you pay on a different platform, but what that usually is, is like, you know, if you're a member, you can post about your business on there. Or if you're a member, you get a certain amount of perks. Um, that requires a little more oversight. So again, it's a little bit less passive because you as the admin, or if you have other admins helping you or interns or whatever, you have to make sure that whoever is posting those things, you know, that they are paid members. So that requires a little bit more oversight. Still not bad. You know, it's still very passive, still very low maintenance. Okay. So those are just options. Um, I'm trying to think if there are any other, I'm sure there are other platforms. I'm a big fan of Facebook. I don't love social media, but I'm sure there's other social media platforms that you could also use to have some kind of membership based subscription. Okay. So those are my top three. All right. So the first one was affiliate marketing or having affiliates. And again, that's not easy. And it, it's often best for anyone that has a large following already. Okay. Um, the second one is, um, selling either tangible or intangible products, but I would say digital products. And again, you could do it through Etsy. You could do it through, um, your own website. You could do it through like Facebook marketplace. I see people doing that. Um, you could do, if you're selling stock photos, you could do it through all those stock photo sites. It's really endless what you could do there. And then the third one was, um, to have subscription based. So whether it's a newsletter that they pay for or a membership on a virtual membership or even a physical something in the mail membership. Memberships are great. Okay. Um, if you have all those revenue streams, first of all, you're killing it. But second of all, if you need another idea, something a little bit more advanced, what is the best social media platform to advertise a service? Oh, Kiana, that's an awesome question. Okay. So Kiana just asked, you might've asked this a few minutes ago. My, my comments are delayed. Um, what is the best social media platform to advertise a service? So it depends on your service and it very much depends on your niche because what you want to do is you want to advertise to wherever your clients are hanging out, right? So, um, if you can write in what your niche is there, if not, we can talk after this, but, um, it is super important, not so much the platform, but that it's the right platform for you. So for instance, for me, I find that Facebook and LinkedIn are really good platforms for me. Okay. Um, but I have a friend who, um, is a life coach and she doesn't feel like LinkedIn is as, you know, it's not, people don't go to LinkedIn necessarily as much for a life coach. Um, I have a friend that's in wellness, um, and she, if, I know, my client, they're all my friends too. So once you're my client, you're like, I consider you a bestie because we talk a lot. Um, so, and usually we just have similar energies. It's just the way it works. So she really has been super successful using Pinterest. Now, Pinterest for me is less of um, a platform that I can leverage. Um, let's say this is great. Oh, awesome, Carla. I love it. Okay, good. Kiana, um, you've been told to do TikTok, but I feel so old. Oh my gosh, Kiana, you are t preaching to the crowd. So I also <laughs> need to do TikTok. Um, so the good thing about TikTok is it's really great for directing traffic to your other platforms. Okay. Now I am in no way, shape or form a social media expert. So I just want to throw that out there because quite frankly, it's not something I love. Um, something I outsource when I can, but I would say that TikTok does have a remarkable ability or a remarkable way of getting people to your other platforms, right? Because they don't have to be your friends. They don't have to be your followers. That's really the huge piece there. Um, I have actually a client of mine that's like a TikTok expert. So if you want, Kiana, send me a message to remind me because my memory. And um, I will ask her based on your niche if she thinks how the best way for you to leverage TikTok because I think it is really great um, for adults. I have mixed feelings on it for children, but I digress. Um, that's the like former high school teacher in me coming through. But um, TikTok is really great for getting eyes onto your other platforms. Okay. So for instance, I should be using TikTok a lot to get eyes onto my YouTube channel. Right. Um, but I kind of want to know more specifically your niche to give you more tailored advice. 
All right, awesome. So I kind of said this, but I don't think I finished saying it. So if you are more, if you've already had, have those, you know, revenue streams nailed down or you don't yet, but you just want to like, you are in this and you're like motivated today, you're like, tell me them all. Another really good, definitely passive, once you've created, once you've done like the, um, uh, what's the word, the like preloading of all the work is to generate an online course, okay? So there's different ways to do an online course. I don't suggest you look at all the gurus on how they do an online course. Those are for like, unless, if you want to by all means, but if you're just starting out, you wanna do an online course, you don't need some complicated sales funnel. You don't need all the things. You don't need to like support it yourself. You can just find something like Udemy or another um, platform that sells courses, create your course and sell it through them. Do you make less money doing it that way? Yes, because they take a cut, okay? But it's more passive in the sense that you don't need all those back end pieces. You don't need all the tech. You don't need all the Facebook ads. And it's great if you um, already have some, maybe some tutorials and things like that that you want to package up into a little online course, put it up there and like kind of forget about it and just remember when you see the money coming in. Okay. Um, so online courses are great for passive income generation. Again, it requires some work on the, at the beginning. Okay. Um, oh, awesome. Kiana. Yes. Definitely message me. Great. Yeah. I'm glad that was helpful. So those are my three top ones. There are so many other passive income sources. Um, and there are, so there's a difference between, oh, I had it up there, but I moved it because of the light. There's a difference between additional revenue source and passive income. So what I'm talking about is additional re revenue sources that are more passive because you're probably already very busy in what you do. Okay. But there are other additional revenue um, streams that aren't as passive. They're active, right? So there are tons of other things you can do if you feel like, you know, you have mastered what you're doing right now and you've kind of hit a ceiling and you need other income streams, reach out to me because there are so many more. Um, and I would love to talk to you about that. And again, it, it is somewhat niche specific or, you know, if you sell a product or if you have, sell a service, um, you know, who your audience is, where they hang out, all those things, it do, that it really does matter. But the three we talked about today are, are really um, some of the best ones for the masses, I would say. Um, so I hope that was helpful. So I would love for you to not just take this information and forget about it. <laughs> um, I know it's tempting. But what I'd love for you to do is kind of like take those three options, right? The three that we discussed and like grab a piece of paper and just like brain dump what you could do with all three of those options for like affiliate marketing. Like are there, do you have a big following on um, Instagram that you could utilize for that? And if so, what affiliates um, for the, um, I'm forgetting the order I said them in, but for selling intangible products, do you already take a ton of like awesome pictures that you want to put on iStock or do you have printables that you could put on Etsy? Um, things like that. So just like brain dump everything. Could you do, does your, does the setup of your business currently work well for a membership program? Okay. And if it doesn't, maybe thinking of that long-term down the road, how you could shift it. So I want you to brain dump. Then I want you to pick the one that's most realistic and applicable to your niche, to your market. Realistic in the sense of you'll do it, right? Don't pick one that's going to require a ton of effort or like really just outside of your wheelhouse right now and add stress and overwhelm because then you're not going to do it right? So pick the one that feels like, okay, yeah, I can do this. I can repurpose this. I already have this. Like, yeah, I feel good about that. And then reach out to me to help figure out any of the details or to figure out how to implement, right? Um, because each one of these, you know, there's, there's more detail on how to do it. 